Okay, so it is March 8, 2014, and we're discussing feeling or choice. And I really believe that this is so, so important. And if we really receive the truth that we're discussing tonight, if we take it to heart and if we believe it and understand it, it might just be the very thing to make things click for someone to yeah. come out of the dry bones and receive life. You know, so we want to keep it short, as I've mentioned, uh, probably within an hour. And, but we want, by the grace of our Heavenly Family, we want this to be as clear as possible. Because if we receive the truth that we're talking about tonight, you can be assured that if you receive it and bring it into practical application in your life, that you will receive the resurrection of the dry bones. So I hope that that sounds very important to everyone here and that everyone wants to listen cleanly and to seek to understand and Heavenly Family, I ask that you help each of you to understand the true simplicity of the gospel. And so, basically what this is about, again, is will or feeling. And if we are, you know, basically what it's about is, what are we to go on? when we receive life or when it comes to anything else, is it feeling or does it come down to a choice? And I'm sure everyone here will say a choice, but what does that mean? What does that imply? And how does that relate? Because lots of times we end up um, doing things based off of feeling without even realizing it. And that doing things based off of feeling could either be doing something actively or just neglecting something because of feeling a certain way. And lots of times we are waiting for a certain feeling before we will believe that we, we have received life. Because after all, you know, it's such a dramatic change, you know, you'd expect that you would feel very different. But is that really what we're supposed to go on? And the other thing that people are waiting for perhaps before they'll say and before they will believe that they've received life, is for a certain feeling to not be there anymore. So not only are lots of times we're waiting for a feeling, but we're actually waiting not to feel. We're waiting for a feeling to go away. Yeah, we're waiting for a feeling to go away. That's exactly it. And this, that in itself, the waiting and the wrong view of the Feeling, those two things, waiting and viewing a feeling in the wrong way, can just, that in itself, can keep someone back from receiving life. So it's, it's so, so important. <clears throat> and lots of times people confuse a feeling that they may have with honesty with their with themselves like lots of times people will say things like you know oh i feel this way and i'm just being honest about it you know which may be good that they're being honest about it and it may be true that they feel that way but the problem is sometimes when people have that perspective is that they don't realize that even though they have that feeling that they have to be dominated by it. And they don't realize that they can be honest with themselves and they can have that feeling and yet not sin. For example, uh, someone might say, I'm angry at so-and-so. Or, you know, I feel this way about so-and-so. Or I think this thought about so-and-so. You know, I feel like this. And I'm just being on about, honest about it. And it's true that they might be honest, but it could be that they're honestly deceived. After all, who led you to feel angry? Just to go with the example of someone feeling angry at so-and-so. Who led you to feel angry? It was the devil, right? In other words, what that was is the devil gave someone a temptation 
to view someone in a certain way and to hold something against another person. And so that was a temptation. But we know that every temptation is based off of a lie. So what has happened when someone says, well, I'm angry at so-and-so, and I'm just being honest about it. What has happened is that there was a temptation, and they accepted that as their own. And that's the only reason why it's true that they are angry with that person, and they're being honest about it. So really, it's the honesty is just showing that they've accepted the devil's temptation as their own. But the thing that made it true that the person is angry with their brother, let's say, is not that they had the feeling of anger. It's because they chose to accept that feeling as the wrong. That's something that's so important to understand because lots of times we'll have a feeling and we will think that because we feel that way, that that's just our condition. In other words, we allow our feelings to inform us about our condition. We allow our feelings to inform us about who we are and where we're at. But is that what we're supposed to use? We have to understand that the devil can tempt us by putting thoughts in our mind, which we're not to accept as our own. When we accept it as our own, that's when it becomes true for us. But if we don't accept it as our own and we reject that thought, then it is not true. It is a lie and it does not apply to us. It was only a temptation. But not only can the devil tempt us with thoughts, but the devil can actually tempt us by causing us to feel a certain way. And he even did this with Christ. And I want to read something from Desire of Agents, page uh, 753. Paragraph 2. So, Desire of Ages 753, Paragraph 2. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. Right there, that's telling you that the devil, as a temptation to Christ, wrung his heart. In other words, he made him feel a certain way. It says the Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Notice that Christ feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Notice that this is describing what Christ felt. Christ felt the fear. Christ felt his heart wrung. He felt anxiety. He felt that he would not uh, even see through to his conquering of the grave. These are the feelings which he had because of the devil imposing it upon him. And I want you all to read the uh, past, the chapter in Desire of Ages about the crucifixion. And you'll see how the devil was uh, totally, the devil and his angels were totally surrounding Christ. And they were imposing all this stuff on him. And he felt it. And he didn't feel the presence of his father. He didn't feel the love of God. He felt the wrath of God. He felt filthy. He felt guilty. He felt like the chief of sinners. He felt that sin was so offensive to God and feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. It says, Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute 
that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. What Christ endured was so terrible. And at the last moments, when he was having the sin put upon him and feeling the weight of it, the you know he was surrounded in darkness, surrounded by the devil, and Elmo even tells us that the angels were instructed not to break that dense cloud of evil angels. You know they were supposed to allow the devil and the evil angels to go and throw all this stuff at him. So we can be assured that he was feeling all this stuff. Anxiety, fear, uh, broken heart, guilt, guilt shame. shame, you know, go down the list. He was feeling anxiety. it all. You know, feeling guilt, feeling anxiety, all those things. And yet, that, you know, that is the experience that Christ had. And yet, did he sin? No. No, because he did not choose to sin. He did not yield his will. So this is important for us to understand because we need to know that the devil can throw all these feelings at us and we will actually feel them. We will actually feel this anxiety, perhaps, in certain circumstances when he's throwing these things at us. He can cause us to feel that way. He can cause us to feel fearful or feel guilty or feel this way or that way, just as he did with Christ. Viewing what happened to Christ on the cross shows us that when the devil tempts us, he can, just like he can put thoughts in our minds, he can also put feelings into us. It's so important to understand because what will happen is he'll give you a feeling and then he will tell you, hey, this is how you feel, this is who you are, therefore you're guilty or you're this or you're that. But we need to understand that we can feel that feeling and then we can reject that feeling as our own. Someone could feel the feel of anger being put onto them for another person. But they can reject that. You know, they can reject the feeling. And it doesn't mean that the devil will all of a sudden completely withdraw the feeling from you so you no longer feel it. And it doesn't mean that our Heavenly Family won't allow him to press it on you even harder. But that trial is a trial we're supposed to rejoice in. And we're not supposed to have that feeling decide for us who we are or what we do or what we think or what we feel. In other words, a feeling impressed upon us does not have to be our own feeling. There's a difference between having it become our own and just feeling the feeling of it. So we need to understand that that is what can happen. <clears throat> but I also want to read something else talking about the will. And this is just so, so, so important. And actually, you know, before that, I want to, before I read these things about the will, I want to actually read another statement from Ellen White where she talks about <clears throat> where she talks about feeling. Let's see. Okay, yes, this is from Review and Herald, April 30, 1889. And this is paragraphs 11 and 12. It says, After Satan rebelled in heaven, against the law of God. He was cast out. Adam and Eve fell under his temptations, and a warfare has been going on ever since 
between good and evil on this earth. Christ has passed over every step of the ground where Adam failed, and he has gained the victory in behalf of humanity. We are to be partakers of the sufferings of Christ and to share his glory. Our trials need not make us unhappy. We need not trust to feeling. For feeling has nothing to do with our religion. Notice that feeling has nothing to do with our religion. Let's keep that in mind. It's so important. The promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And our feelings do not alter the case in heaven. We are to live by faith. When you repent of your sins, Satan will try to make you believe that there is no hope for you. But you can tell him that Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. Tell him that Christ died for you and that you claim the merits of his blood in your behalf. There has been a fountain open for sin and uncleanness, and you may wash your robes and make them white. We are to have our lives hid in Jesus. While we live in the world, we are not to be of the world. By faith, we may behold the curtain rolled back and see the glories of the eternal world. We shall then realize that our trials are light affliction which are but for a moment, which work out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So notice that when we repent, the devil will be trying to make us believe that there's no hope. And he'll make us feel like there's no hope, or feel like this, or feel like that. But we're not to trust in feeling, because feeling has nothing to do with our religion. We need to hand our will over to God. We're also told in uh, the book, Upward Look, Upward Look, page 37, paragraph 4. We need a more firm reliance upon a thus saith the Lord. If we have this, we shall not trust to feeling and be ruled by feeling. God asks us to rest in his love. It is our privilege to know the word of God as a sure and tried guide, an infallible assurance. Let us work on the faith side of the question. Let us believe and trust and talk faith and hope and courage. Let the praise of God be in our hearts and on our lips, oftener than it is. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, Psalm 50, 23. Keep the mind stayed upon God and know the love of Christ as the word of God reveals it. This word is life. Talk of Christ. Call others to behold him as your redeemer. Notice how important that is to just go off of thus saith the Lord. You know, we're told to receive life. So let's receive it. Let's not wait to feel like we are receiving it, but let's just receive it. In the book Christian Experience, page 118, paragraph 1, this is what it says. Christian Experience, 118, paragraph 1. Those who humbly and prayerfully search the scriptures to know and to do God's will, will not be in doubt of their obligations to God, 
For if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. John 7.17 7, If you would know the mystery of godliness, you must follow the plain word of truth. Feeling or no feeling, emotion or no emotion. Amen. That's so important. Feeling or no feeling, emotion or no emotion. Let us grasp hold of the promise and believe it. Let us say, I know that the word is true. I know it says, believe and you'll be saved. So let's know that and let's believe it. And regardless of what we feel, whether we feel something or don't feel something, whether we feel some great feeling come over us or not, let's ask and let's know that our Heavenly Family will give it to us immediately. Whether we feel discouraged or not, if we feel like God is far from us, don't rely on that feeling. The Word is nigh thee, even in your mouth. The very fact that we're here and we're hearing this right now shows that our Heavenly Family is not far from us. The devil may give us a feeling that God is far from us, but he's not. Our Heavenly Family is not far from us. So let's understand that. Let's believe that. Let's know that and know that they are eager to justify us, whether we feel that they are eager to justify us or not. So, if you would know the mystery of godliness, you must follow the plain word of truth. Feeling or no feeling, emotion or no emotion, obedience must be rendered from a sense of principle, and the right must be pursued under all circumstances. So, notice, obedience, in Romans 6, it says, talking about those who would receive the new life of Christ, it says they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to them. It has been given to us all the ability to give our will to God. We can obey that instruction. We can. It's The power has been given to us to do that. So let's do it. And don't even think about how you'll feel about doing it. Just simply do it. Honestly say to God, I give my will to you. And then at that point, know that it is done. And don't turn back. Don't allow a feeling to get in your way. In other words, partly what you're saying right there is, once you make that choice and you've decided to accept the life that our Heavenly Family is offering. And then if you start feeling even anger towards your brother, all you have to do is not accept that feeling as your own. Don't act it out. Is that what you mean? Don't act it out. Well, it's not just about not acting out because you can sin by being angry with your brother. If you're angry in your heart against your brother, you have committed murder, right? So, so don't, it's, it's not just this thing of acting out outwardly, you know. It's that if we get a feeling imposed upon us, reject it. Don't allow it to be yours. Don't accept it. Don't say... And don't say it within yourself or out loud or whatever in any regards. Don't say that you're angry with your brother. You know, the, Walter says, question the thought. Exactly. You know, don't accept it. If, if there's a feeling that gets imposed upon you, don't say that that's me. Don't say that that's my feeling that I'm feeling. That's, you know, what, that's part of what I mean by acting it out. Acting it out in your mind or physically right. doing something. Most people mm -hmm. that are angry with someone don't physically act it out. Right. You know? That's why I wanted to clarify that, though, so that, you know, that people won't think that it's just about what you do outwardly. Yeah. Because it is 
so important, you know, when that feeling comes, just because that feeling comes upon you does not mean that you are angry with your brother. Right? I mean, the feeling can come upon you. A feeling of sadness, a feeling of anxiety, a feeling... All these feelings can be brought upon us. And usually what happens... Here's the thing. Our experience that we've had in the past has always told us that, well, if I certainly I feel angry with my brother, I am angry with my brother. Because we accept the feeling as our own. That we don't see that there's a difference between a feeling that could be imposed upon us and how we truly are. So this is, it's just so important to realize, hey, look, a feeling could get imposed upon me, but that doesn't mean I have to go with that. A feeling of anger could get imposed on me, but I don't have to be angry. You know, even though a feeling could get imposed on me, anger is the choice to accept that feeling as your true state. Go ahead. This makes me think of another example that could quite possibly even be more easily understood by people. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that many, if not all of us, have probably experienced. Have you ever felt sad and you couldn't explain why? Like you feel like you could cry, but... You can't think of a reason why you would want to cry. And so we've all heard this, I think, where, well, just choose to be happy. You know, just don't allow yourself to be sad. Right. If you don't have a reason to be sad, you know, even though you're feeling like you're sad, just choose to be happy. And it's not to be confused, though, with, this um, concept that faith healers put out there or even, you know, some some other, uh, I forget the word, charismatic type healers and things, they'll be like, oh, you have to think positive because as you, the more you think that you're healed, then it'll become a reality that you're healed. I'm not talking about that because that's it's just a completely different situation yeah. anyway. But to be tempted to feel sad isn't the same as feeling sad. Yeah. You don't give in to it and start to wallow and, oh, woe is me. And then, then you've done that. It's the same thing. And you could, also say, you could also say that feeling sad is not necessarily the same as being sad. When you, be, when, you are, when you are sad, you've chosen to accept that feeling as your own. So... The other thing that I want to, another example of this is what we see here with Ellen White's statement. She says, if you would know the mystery of godliness, you must follow the plain word of truth, feeling or no feeling, emotion or no emotion. Obedience must be rendered from a sense of principle, and the right must be pursued under all circumstances. So there... Again, the principle is that often people will have a feeling, and because they accept that feeling as their own, or because they don't have a certain feeling, and they accept not having that feeling as their own, often we excuse ourselves from obedience. For example, someone could be... You hear people say often, well, I'm just not convicted on that. You know, yeah, I know that it's not right, but I'm just not convicted of it. You know, people say that sort of thing all the time. All the time. You know, well, just I'll end up one day, you know, I'll be convicted on it. That's good that you're convicted on it, but I'm just not convicted on it. They even well, think that it won't even be a good thing to do what's right unless they're convicted on it. You're right. They do think that it won't be a good thing to do what's right unless they're convicted. But here's the thing. Being truly convicted is not a feeling. You can be convicted and not feel like you're convicted. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is this is the mistake that people won't feel convicted and because of that lack of feeling will neglect to do the right thing. We have been given 
and this is what I mean here when it comes to resurrection, for example, being raised from the dry bones. Often, we, one side of it is that we feel a certain way. We may feel so guilty. We may feel unworthy. We may feel this or that. And because of these feelings, we think that God won't accept us. And on the other side, we don't feel accepted. We don't feel like we have um, faith. We don't feel like we can ask God in all honesty. We don't feel, you know, feeling like we don't have faith is an important one. We don't feel like we have faith. And because of us not feeling like we have faith, when we accept that feeling of faithlessness as our own, that's when it's a problem. But you can feel like you don't have faith and yet decide to believe the word and receive life. Amen. You know, and so whenever there's something that you know is right, out of principle, render yourself to that. Render obedience. Willingly give yourself over to God to do that right thing, regardless of what you feel. So don't wait till you feel conviction. Once you know something is right, once the instruction has been given to you, once inspiration has spoken, follow inspiration. And inspiration says, awake, arise, shake thyself from the dust, put on beautiful garments, receive life. Take that and regardless of what you feel, know it is true and accept it. Believe it, regardless of what you feel. So it says here, speaking of that character, the character of someone who would know the mystery of God, who follows the plain word of truth, feeling or no feeling, emotion or no emotion, where it says obedience must be rendered from a sense of principle and the right must be pursued under all circumstances. The next sentence of this quote, this is still from uh, what's it, oh yeah, Christian experience. Still from Christian experience, 118 paragraph 1. Same quote. Continuing on that quote, it says, This is the character that is elected of God unto salvation. Notice that. This is so important because this whole time we've been trying to understand how do we receive life? Well, the one who doesn't go off feeling but chooses, right? The one who renders obedience out of a sense of principle regardless of what they feel or don't feel. It says this is the character that is elected of God unto salvation. The test of a genuine Christian is given in the word of God. Jesus says, if thou love me, keep my commandments. John fourteen fifteen. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto me and make our abode, or come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sins, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. If you just... Uh, type in the phrase feeling or no feeling into the Elamite disk, you should find it. <clears throat> so Elamite continues. She says here, here are the conditions upon which every soul will be elected to eternal life. Your obedience to God's commandments will prove your right to an inheritance with the saints in light, God has elected a certain excellence of character. And every one who, through the grace of Christ, shall reach the standard of his requirement, will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of glory. All who would reach this standard of character will have to employ the means that God has provided to this end. And we're going to find out in some of the next quotes, what are the means that God has provided to this end? If ye would inherit the rest that remaineth for the children of God, 
you must become a co-laborer with God. You are elected to wear the yoke of Christ, to bear his burden, to lift his cross. You are to be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Second Peter 1.10 Search the scriptures, and you will see that not a son or daughter of Adam is elected to be saved in disobedience of God's law. The world makes void the law of God, but Christians are chosen to sanctification through obedience to the truth. They are elected to bear the cross if they would wear the crown. So notice, she's clearly talking about receiving life from our heavenly family, being justified and living the sanctified life. And she says here that it must be obedience rendered from a sense of principle, not based off of feeling, whether there's feeling or not, whether there's emotion or not. So what is it, how is it that we can then, by this, actually receive that life? We're told in the book Education, page 289, this is Education 289. It says, Every child should understand the true force of the will. He should be led to see how great is the responsibility involved in this gift. The will is the governing power in the nature of man the power of decision or choice. Notice what she's saying here. It's so wonderful. It's not that feeling is the governing power of man. It is that the will, the choice, the power of decision. This is the governing power in the nature of man. Every human being possessed of wisdom has power to choose the right. In every experience of life, God's word to us is, choose you this day whom you will serve. So today, let us choose today who we will serve. We don't need to wait for a feeling to come or feeling to go. Choose this day who you will, who you will serve. Everyone may place his will on the side of the will of God may choose to obey him, and by thus linking himself with divine agencies, he may stand where nothing can force him to do evil. In every youth, every child, lies the power, by the help of God, to form a character of integrity and to live a life of usefulness. So it's just so important to understand the importance of choice and that we have been, been given the power and to choose this day whom you will serve. In Testimonies, Volume 1, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 261, Ellen White is speaking there of how we have the perils of the last days among us, you know, how all these terrible things are happening and how the church is still in such a terrible condition. And she talks about... Uh, actually, I'll start on page uh, 260. 260, the last paragraph. It says here, We are amid the perils of the last days. Greater perils are before us, and yet... We are not awake. This lack of activity and earnestness in the cause of God is dreadful. This death stupor is from Satan. Do you notice that? Here she's saying, here we are in the perils of the last days, and greater perils are before us, and yet we're not awake. This lack of activity and earnestness in the cause of God is dreadful. This death stupor is from Satan. 
Notice how she's pointing out the dry bones condition. This death stupor. That's what she's speaking of. Let's keep that in mind. Then she says, He controls the minds of unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and leads them to be jealous of one another, fault-finding and censorious. It is his special work to divide hearts that the influence, strength, and labor of God's servants may be kept among unconsecrated Sabbath keepers, and their precious time be occupied in settling little differences when it should be spent in proclaiming the truth to unbelievers. Notice, she's pointing out the dry bones condition. And this is the condition that we've been looking at this whole time. This is the condition which we have all found ourselves in, but which now, finally, the resurrection of the dry bones is upon us. So let's choose to receive life. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24, 15. So continuing on here in Testimonies 1, 261, paragraph 1, this is what it says, speaking in context of the dry bones condition. I was shown God's people waiting for some change to take place, a compelling power to take hold of them. Isn't that what people have been waiting for here? You know, we want to receive life, we want to have this resurrection of the dry bones, and yet we feel like we're waiting for something, right? We are waiting for some change to take place, a compelling power to take hold of us, right? That's what we've seen. Then she says, for those who are waiting, she says, but they will be disappointed, for they are wrong. They must act. They must take hold of the work themselves and earnestly cry to God for a true knowledge of themselves. The scenes which are passing before us are of sufficient magnitude to cause us to arouse and urge the truth home to the hearts of all who will listen. The harvest of the earth is nearly ripe. Now that was when she was writing Testimonies, Volume 1, the harvest of the earth is nearly ripe. But you know what Psalm chapter 4 declares concerning this time? It tells us that the harvest is ripe, that there are many who will say, who are saying, who will show us goodness? Yahweh, let the light of your count, or lift up the light of your countenance upon us or lift up the light of your presence, rather. You know, there are many out there who are ready to hear the truth. The harvest is ripe. The harvest today is ripe. And today, the resurrection of the dry bones has begun. However small, as a mustard seed, the kingdom may be, it will grow. Amen. And how will it grow? Let us exercise the will, the free will, and the choice that our Heavenly Family has given to us. Let us exercise it and then believe and know who they are and what they have given us, regardless of what we feel. Whether or not the devil throws a feeling of helplessness upon us or a feeling of guilt after we accept the life of our Heavenly Family. Because be sure that after you receive life, the devil will try to convince you that you haven't received anything. Be sure of that. Know that the devil will try to convince you of all. So accept life. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Not based off feeling, but choose. This quote is taken from uh, I think it's uh, Messages to Young People page 151 paragraph 1 is one place where at least the first part of this quote is found but then there's um, another book is it 
Christian, no, Christian oh. teachings and Bible hiding, or Christian, what is it? I don't know. Something like Christian teachings and Bible hiding. I forget if that's the exact title, but it's CTBH. CTBH, page 147, paragraph 3. 147, paragraph 3 is where it starts, but it goes on to the next page. Yes, Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. That's what it is. Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. And the reason why I mentioned both is because at first I found the quote in Messages to Young People, but only quoted the first part. And then later in Christian temperance and Bible hygiene, it says the same thing. Only the first sentence is missing from the quote. So I'm going to read the first sentence of it, which isn't found in the Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, and then I'm going to read the rest from that book. So notice how when we read, um, in one of the quotes we read, Ellen White says <clears throat> that feeling has nothing to do with our religion. Feeling has nothing to do with our religion. Now, in this quote, she says, pure religion has to do with the will. You see that? Feeling has nothing to do with our religion. Pure religion has to do with the will. That needs to be so firmly fixed in our minds. Not based off the feeling. Feeling has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with our religion. That's not denying that feelings will exist. And not all feeling is wrong or anything like that. But that's not what our religion is about. It's not about feeling. Pure religion has to do with the will. The will is the governing power in the nature of man. There she says it again. The will is the governing power in the nature of man. If the will is set right, all the rest of the being will come under its sway. The will is not the taste or the inclination. Notice that. The will is not the taste or the inclination, but it is the choice the deciding power, the kingly power, which works in the children of men unto obedience to God or to disobedience. Notice that. It's so important. The next paragraph, she says, you will be in constant peril until you understand the true force of the will. Isn't that what we've been experiencing when we go based off of feelings, when we don't feel like we have enough faith? Therefore, how can we receive life? Because I don't feel like I have enough faith. You know, and that's an honest condition that we've all been in, where we don't feel like we have enough faith. Therefore, how can we, how can we receive life? This is why she says, you will be in constant peril until you understand the true force of the will. That should encourage you, because now you can understand that regardless of what you feel, even if you still feel like you don't have enough faith, that if you understand what we're talking about here, how it doesn't matter whether or not you have the feeling of faith or not, and that it doesn't matter how you feel, but that you can just choose. Understanding this will liberate you, you know? Amen. You no longer have to be in constant peril because we will be in constant peril until we understand the true force of the will. But notice, the will, by exercising the will which our Heavenly Family has given us to just yield our members unto them, to just choose them. So that's it. That's it. That's all it takes. The power of the will has been given to us. Now, all we have to do is choose. 
doesn't matter how you feel, just choose. You may believe, and this is continuing on in the same quote, you may believe and promise all things, but your promises and your faith are of no account until you put your will on the right side. That's so important. Notice that. You may believe and promise all things, but your promises and your faith are of no account until you put your will on the right side. If you will fight the fight of faith with your willpower, there is no doubt that you will conquer. There is no doubt that you will conquer. Your part is to put your will on the side of Christ. When you yield your will to his, he immediately takes possession of you and works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. <laughs> That's just so beautiful, isn't it? When you yield your will to his, he immediately takes possession of you and works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Your nature is brought under the control of his spirit. Even your thoughts are subject to him. If you cannot control your impulses, your emotions, as you desire, you can control the will. And thus the entire change will be wrought in your life. Regardless of your emotions or your impulses or your, or your desires, we're being told here, not that some can control the will. We're being told that you can control the will. And thus, the entire change will be wrought in your life. When you yield up your will to Christ, your life is hid with Christ in God. It is allied to the power which is above all principalities and power. The wicked gods won't be able to force you to do anything against your will. Just yield your will to Christ, and your life will be hid with Christ and God above all principalities and powers. You have a strength from God that holds you fast to his strength and, in a, and a new life, even the life of faith, is possible to you. You can never be successful in elevating yourself unless your will is on the side of Christ, cooperating with the Spirit of God. Do not feel that you cannot, but say, I can, I will. And God has pledged his Holy Spirit to help you in every decided effort. Your effort must be a decided effort. What that means is to decide. Decide. Choose. Choose to place your will on the side of Christ's will. Yield your will to him. It doesn't matter if you feel like you have no faith. It doesn't matter if you feel like God is far from you. Our sister is here breathing life into the dry bones, and she is eager, even anxious, anxious to give the life, the righteousness of Christ to you. And you can accept it. You're not being told that you can't accept it. You may not feel some magnificent thing, even after you choose, but you can choose and immediately, Christ will take possession of you and will work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the promise. It's a promise. Let's take it and let's claim it and choose to believe it. And that's it. Just choose to place your will with Christ. Now, there's just one other thing I want to read. 
And this is the last quote. Desire of Ages, page 202. And this is in context of Christ speaking to the man who was trying to be healed by entering into the pool. But he couldn't, because he couldn't walk. So notice, this is what it says. Speaking of that man, Jesus does not ask this sufferer to exercise faith in him. He simply says, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. But the man's faith takes hold upon that word. Every nerve and muscle thrills with new life, and healthful action comes to his crippled limbs. Without question, he sets his will to obey the command of Christ, and all his muscles respond to his will. Springing to his feet, he finds himself an active man. Jesus had given him no assurance of divine help. The man might have stopped to doubt and lost his one chance of healing, but he believed Christ's word. And in acting upon it, he received strength. Notice that this man, wanting to be healed by getting into the pool, he's in the position that branches find themselves in, isn't it? You know, this man has his bones and his flesh and his skin. You know, he's a, he's a whole man, but he cannot utilize the body which is given to him. Just like a branch Davidian, you know, someone who believes the branch messages have the messages represented by the bones and the sinews and the flesh, and the skin, you know, are have all these things, but we can't come into action because we're dead, right? That's the same place that this guy was in. He needed the action to come into his life. He needed the life of Christ. And Christ just says, rise, take up thy bed and walk. That is what is said to us. Rise, take up your bed, walk. Simply believe that and do it. Set your will to obey that command. To rise to newness of life. Springing to his feet, he finds himself an active man. That's what Ellen White said about him. So Ellen White, continuing on the same quote, she says, Through the same faith we may receive spiritual healing. By sin, we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied. Of ourselves, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man of um, capable of walking. Notice, he was not capable of walking. There are many who realize their helplessness. Notice this next part. It's so important. There are many who realize their helplessness and who long for that spiritual life which will bring them into harmony with God. They are vainly striving to obtain it. In despair they cry, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death, Romans 7.24. Isn't that exactly what our experience has been in seeking the resurrected life? You know, we realize our helplessness and we long for that spiritual life. We long for harmony with God and we're striving to obtain it. And we cry out, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let these desponding, struggling ones Look up. The Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood. 
saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Notice, do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Wherever or whatever may be the evil practice, the master, this is still the same quote, page, uh, it went from 202 to 203, but still same quote in Desire of Ages. Notice what it's saying, though. It's, it's just so characterizing the exact condition of dry bones crying out for life, right? This is the exact condition that any here who have been seeing their need, who have been feeling their helplessness, and who have been striving to obtain the resurrected life, this is the exact condition in which you find yourself in. All who have been there doing this, hearing this message, and yet not receiving light. Notice it says that it tells us to look up. It says the Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood, which is you, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion through which long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. Whatever your issue is, whatever it may be that you feel is binding you more than anything, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. Ephesians 2, 1. He will set, the, uh, set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. You know, right now, the message that we have is to proclaim liberty to the captives. And it is just beautiful. It's just so beautiful. This is the message that we have. This is the light that our Heavenly Family is just wanting to give to us. Walter says, Amen. Let us pray for all of us to cross over together, or at least soon. And by soon, I hope you mean immediately. Because there's no point to wait. You know, waiting is the devil's game. You know, we are told that we don't need to wait for the new life because Christ longs to give it to us. Right? He longs to. Our sister has been here pleading with us to simply choose. And now we can just choose. And I hope and pray that this study tonight has really made it clear to everyone, has really, you know, shown us and made us to understand the power of the will and the ability that we have been given from our Heavenly Family to put our will on their side, to choose their righteousness, regardless of feeling, regardless of emotion, whether it's there or not, whether positive or negative, whether it's there or not, regardless of all that, let's just choose and even if we don't feel that we're made whole, even if we don't feel like we have faith, 
that's what it is. Step out in faith. Let's do it. Let's put our feet into the river. You know, let's just dive into this new life. That's what is being put before us. So without further delay, let's pray and ask our Heavenly Family. Our dear, dear Heavenly Family. Here we are before you, seeking your righteousness and your very life. And you've told us that we have a just claim to it. In fact, you've even revealed to us recently that this truth and this life, you even consider it to be ours because you've given it to us just as you have bought us to be yours, dear brother. Sister, I ask that you forcibly impress it upon the minds of all here that they are your purchased possession, that you are the purchased possession of the blood of Christ, that your very life has been poured out to buy us, and that because of that, brother, we can receive your very life that you've given it to us already and that it's simply our choice to receive it. I ask that you just drive it so clearly home to each person here that it does not matter how you feel. It does not matter whether or not you don't feel like you have faith. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're still guilty or faithless or you're this or that. And it doesn't matter if you feel this feeling of conviction. Heavenly Family, I ask that you just really drive it home. And I want to say here that this day, I and all who are willing to say it with me, choose you and your will and your life. That my will is no longer my own, but it is yours. And regardless of what I feel, I know that you will will to do, to do and to will, your good works of righteousness in me and in everyone here who chooses to simply hand their will over to you. And so, Heavenly Family, I want to thank you for your life and thank you for giving it so freely to everyone here. And I want to thank you for giving us a clear message, letting us know that we can simply choose, and it is done. And I, too, want to ask that as any here who have just received your life, have just reached out the hand of faith in giving their will to you, I want to ask that you help them as they endure the trials before us of the devil imposing feelings upon us and putting thoughts into our minds, trying to convince us that you haven't given us your life or that we haven't received it or whatever it may be. I know that the devil will always accuse the brethren Mm -hmm. until that final day where the accusations can no longer be heard. But regardless of what accusations may come, Heavenly Family, I ask for the continual strength daily imparted to each individual here to resist the temptation and to see clearly the lies of the devil, to really know whether they feel it or not, but to know that every temptation that the devil throws must be a lie and to know that they don't have to receive it. Heavenly Family, thank you so much. You have given us your all. You've poured out your fullness for us. What more can we ask for? You have given it all, and there's nothing to prevent us from receiving your life. So thank you so much. Thank you for setting up and establishing this mustard seed of a kingdom 
which we know and believe will grow because we know that your word declares that the truth to give us life and the life which you've given is here. And this is the message which will bring this seed, this word of life to all the multitudes out there who are ready. So thank you so much, Heavenly Family. We believe your word. We believe your truth. And that's a settled and done deal. Thank you so much. Father, Mother, in the name of the brat, this is what I ask. And I want to ask, brother, that you just plead your blood on behalf of everyone here. And thank you so much for doing so. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Thank you, Father, Mother. In their beautiful and precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us be diligent to daily encourage one another. It's so important to let us let us encourage one another because it's a real battle. You know, Christ, he lived a sinless life, but the devil always threw things at him, you know? And that's the life of Christ that we will live. A life of victory, but the devil will always throw stuff at us. But trust and know that our heavenly family will keep you. They will keep you. Know it. Just know it. And it's just so beautiful. And so, uh, thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Wow. Wow. I love you all so much. And our Heavenly Family loves you all so, so much. Amen. Does somebody else have something that they'd like to say? I just wanted to say I hope we don't have as much trouble convincing others as you haven't convincing us. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There was something adorable about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, our Heavenly Family is willing to bear along with us. You know, they are so willing to bear along with us. And they are in bringing us out of this dry bones, you know, they are showing us more and more and bringing us out of darkness into clearer and clearer and more ever abundant light, you know, and as we all go forth in the new life of our heavenly family, proclaiming the truth, being aroused to that activity, people will see, this is, this is what Christ was praying for, that love and unity among us, right? And as people see that with more and more of us, it'll be a more and more powerful witness and a testimony to them. And we'll be able to explain to them in clear, simple terms, the gospel. And we will be taught in the school of Christ how to bring the message in clearer and clearer terms. And so the struggle that we've had to go through in coming to understand this and receive it, I hope and pray that those in the future won't have to, you know. And, man, it is it is just so wonderful what our Heavenly Family is doing. And I know that this is the message that is going to be sounded to bring light to the whole you know, and uh, thank you, Heavenly Family. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Man, I just look forward to seeing what's going to happen with this message going out and people receiving life because, you know, the prophecies are being fulfilled and Life, you know, Ellen White talks about how when we receive life, we become as a spring of water, you know, spring up into everlasting life. And these are the prophecies of the 9th Reformation, you know, springs of water issuing forth in the wilderness. And this is what's happening. And it's not going to stop. You know, it's not going to stop. It's just we're so at the beginning of this. And there are so many out there who are just 
bound in the bondage of sin like we have been our whole lives. And man, there, I, now I hope it's just, it's so simple to us all that we can just bring that to them, you know? And we know what it's like to be in the death of, you know, sins and trespasses. That's been our whole experience, right? And then now we can burst forth in newness of life and impart to others what we have received from our heavenly family. You know, it is so beautiful. Walter says, behold the unconditional love of God. Amen. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's so Amen. wonderful. 